Bonjour à tous. Uh, good morning, everyone, dear participants. On behalf of uh, the experts in international trade at the Chamber of Commerce of Metropolitan Montreal, we welcome you to our webinar of the International Meeting Series. Today's topic is the overview of the international development market spotlight on the United Nations. I would like to thank the Economic Development Agency of Canada for the regions of Quebec for its ongoing support of World Trade Center Montreal's activities who made this webinar possible. My name is Camille Crozier, and I'm a project manager in the international market development at the Chamber of Commerce of Metropolitan Montreal. For your information, our international panelists will speak English during their presentation. I will moderate this webinar in English. I might switch to French if we have questions from the audience. Pour votre information, nos invités internationaux utiliseront l'anglais lors de leur présentation. Toutefois, si vous avez des questions en français, il me fera un plaisir d'y répondre. Please take a moment to look at the platform. If you have any questions, please write them in the designated Q&A box located on the bottom center of your screen, and we'll address them towards the end of the webinar. You may ask your questions in the official language of your choosing, and I will be happy to translate for you if needed. I would like, um, if you would like to watch this webinar again, we'll make the recording available on the Chamber of Commerce of Metropolitan website, as well as our YouTube page. Today, I have the honor to introduce Leah Johnson, Trade Commissioner at the Office of Liaison with the International Financial Institutions at the Embassy of Canada in Washington. So prior to joining the team, Leah was a procurement officer for aid funded business with the Department for International Trade at the British Embassy in Washington. In this role, she helped UK companies navigate and find success with the World Bank Group, the Inter-American Development Bank and the Millennium Challenge Corporation. Her first role at the British Embassy was as a business development associate for the life sciences and healthcare sector promoting both trade and investment expansion to the UK by firms from the Mid-Atlantic. Once again, welcome everyone. And Leah, you now have the floor. Good morning, everyone. My name is Leah Johnston and welcome to today's webinar on the UN. Um, next slide, please. I am based in Washington, D.C., as Camille said, in the Office of Liaison with the International Financial Institutions. Um, we call ourselves LIFI for short, um, and I'll be joined by David Costello from the United Nations Procurement Division. I'm going to provide a brief overview of the Canadian Trade Commissioner Service and how we can support Canadian companies, um, and then I'll be handing over to David, who's going to be talking a lot more about what it's like to work with the U.N., so for those of you who are unfamiliar with the Trade Commissioner Service, our role is to support Canadian companies as they work abroad. Um, we can assess your market potential for emerging markets. Um, we can identify qualified key contacts within the regions and institutions that we cover. We can help you resolve problems that may arise during the procurement process and help you understand what are your rights as a bidder. Um, we coordinate Canadian participation in key events, such as this webinar today, um, sector-specific trade missions, business opportunity fairs, and other virtual events, um, as well as in person, eventually. Um, we disseminate business opportunities when we know that there is Canadian interest or expertise in a certain subsector or interest in a certain country. Um, we don't follow every UN or IFI project given the volume, but we try to send out ones when we know that there's um, gonna be interest from our clients. Next slide, please. Um, the Alifi office that I'm a part of, along with Julie Mann, is a little bit different from regular trade commissioners. Um, most trade commissioners are split up by sector and by region or by state. Um, our role is to cover institutions, and given the global remit of the UN and the World Bank that we cover, um, we have a very wide-ranging portfolio. Um, our role is to help you navigate these institutions, understand how they operate, um, how to find business opportunities, what is the appropriate way to engage with their staff, 
and really try to set up companies to be in the best place for success when they're bidding on these opportunities. Next slide, please. So the Alifi Trade Commissioners are a global network and we're all co-located with the major IFIs. As I've mentioned, I'm in Washington covering the World Bank Group, the Inter-American Development Bank, the two US agencies for international development being USAID and the Millennium Challenge Corporation, as well as, and more importantly for this webinar, the New York agencies of the UN. Um, I have a colleague in Bridgetown who covers the Caribbean Development Bank, um, one in Abidjan covering the African Development Bank, one in Manila covering the Asian Development Bank, and one in Beijing covering the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, which is one of the newer IFIs. Um, while we don't have the exact same network on the UN side, I have colleagues that are based in the other uh, cities where UN agencies are headquartered, which is Copenhagen, Rome, and Geneva, who can also provide support on the agencies um, in their cities. And it would be a similar level of support around making connections with those agencies and helping you understand the business opportunities that are available. Um, as Camille mentioned, we'll be sending out this recording and the slides. So if you're interested in being connected um, to any of my colleagues based around the world covering the other institutions, please feel free to reach out to me and I would be happy uh, to make that connection. Uh, next slide, please. So why should you consider bidding on UN projects? Well, if you're on this webinar, you're probably already somewhat interested but the UN marketplace is around 17 billion um, annually, and they procure a wide range of products and services. David's gonna go into a lot more detail about the actual products and services um, that are available. And um, one thing to note is that the IFI market is quite different from the UN marketplace, but they do have similar procurement principles, which they're trying to promote transparency, um, and bring integrity and fairness into the process, um, as well as um, encourage international competitive bidding, um, meaning Canadian firms are eligible to bid on these opportunities. Um, one thing to note is that we are, the Canada is a founding member of the UN and we are represented in our permanent mission in New York um, through our Ambassador Robert Ray. Um, so my colleagues that are in the permanent mission, their role is to provide strategic guidance to the UN and represent Canada um, as a member of the UN system. So their role is on the policy side, whereas my role is on the business side, helping companies um, bid on the opportunities. And I just make that different, you know, make that clear in case anyone has any questions about how our roles differ. Um, next slide, please. So to wrap up my presentation, I thought I would include one quick statistic um, about the UN and Canada. Um, David has more about Canadian performance at the UN, um, but in 2020, 70% of uh, four UN agencies accounted for 70% of the total value of UN contract awards for Canadian firms. Um, those agencies are the WHO, which I'm sure we're all familiar with at this point, uh, the World Food Program, the United Nations Development Program, and last but not least, the United Nations Procurement Division, um, of which we have David here to talk about. So with that, I will wrap up and hand back over to Camille and say thank you for your time today, everyone. All right, thank you very much, uh, Leah, for your presentation. So everyone, let me uh, introduce David Costello, Procurement Officer at the United Nations uh, Procurement Division, Office of Supply Chain Management. So David uh, has 20 years of procurement experience in both the private and public sectors. He's worked for the UN Common System for a total period of 15 years at the UN headquarters in New York and uh, with the United Nations missions in Sudan. David has also been a senior buyer at uh, Sikorsky Aircraft in Connecticut. He's an MBA business policy and strategic leadership from the University of New Haven and a Bachelor of Art degree from Fairfield University with a double major in political, political science and international studies. So David, you now have the floor. Okay, Camille, thanks very much. Thank you very much, Leah. And thanks to all the participants here today and thanks to the organizers for having me. 
Uh, my name is David Costello. I'm a procurement officer with the United Nations Procurement Division in New York. And I'm here today to present you doing business with the United Nations. Um, as you heard from my bio, I have experience in both headquarters procurement and in field procurement. Uh, so hopefully this level of experience will allow me to give you a very comprehensive overview of what it means to do business with the UN. Um, so without further ado, we can get started. We can go to the next slide, please. Okay, so let's start by talking about areas of operation. Um, and I am here today representing the United Nations Secretariat. Okay, so what does that mean to represent the Secretariat? Uh, the Secretariat is the actual physical Secretariat building in New York. And, it, and under the Secretariat umbrella, we also have a large number of offices away from headquarters. Our primary clients are the missions. And when we talk about missions, we're talking about two different types of missions, peacekeeping missions, and special political missions, okay? I won't go into too much detail about the differences, but the peacekeeping missions generally will have a military component. You, the blue helmets that you see on television, these are coming from troop contributing countries and they are deployed to the peacekeeping operations around the world. Um, there's a few areas here that are not pinpointed that I think are very important for vendors and potential vendors to be aware of. Uh, the first is in Southeast Italy, we have a logistics base. It's called the United Nations Global Service Center, UNGSC. That's in Brindisi, Italy on the heel of the boot. In Brindisi, we have our strategic deployment stock, our SDS. And we have a variety of different goods that are stored in Brindisi for rapid deployment to the missions. Okay, so that's a very important location to be aware of. And the second location to be aware of is in Entebbe, Uganda. About an hour south of Kampala is the city of Entebbe. And Entebbe is a forward operating base that we have in the region uh, where there are many other peacekeeping missions. And they are that office is there to support those missions. Okay, so when you start to do more business with the UN, you'll hear about Brindisi and you will hear about Entebbe quite frequently. There are other secretariat clients as well. We have the Department of Safety and Security, the United Nations Office on drugs and crime and a, and a whole host of other UN secretariat entities that we support. Those entities have more of a global reach. Um, for example, the resident coordinator system has a representative in almost every country in the world, um, but they don't buy to the same quantities as the missions. The missions are the main driver of spend in the UN secretariat. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is the organizational chart of the United Nations Procurement Division. It starts with the office, office of the director. And then we have two different services, the technology and infrastructure support service and the transportation and life support service. The teams within these two services are responsible for establishing global systems contracts in support of the goods and services that are needed to support those entities mentioned on the previous, uh, in the previous slide, okay? Um, it's very important to mention here that when we start looking at procurement opportunities, the solicitation itself can originate from New York and it generally will if we're gonna establish a global systems contracts that all of those entities can use or the procurement may originate with the missions themselves. Okay, all of those missions have a delegation of procurement authority up to a certain amount depending on the good or the service they're looking to procure. So when you start to do business with the UN, you'll see that you may be reaching out directly and contacted directly by the missions for certain requirements or some of these offices in New York. And you'll see also on the right-hand side, we have the global procurement support section. This was previously known as the regional procurement office. Now it's GPSS. GPSS is based in Entebbe. It is our procurement support office in Entebbe, but it reports directly to the office of the director in New York. Next slide, please. Okay, here we have some procurement volumes between 2015 and, and 2020, we can see uh, about 2.7 to $3.2 billion in procurement from the secretariat alone in New York. And I think it's important to mention here that uh, the figures that we do not see here are those from what we call agencies, funds, and programs. Okay, so what are the agencies, funds, and programs? Leah mentioned a few of them earlier. Uh, we have agencies such as UNICEF, the United Nations Children's Funds, Fund, WFP, WHO, the United Nations Development Program, the Population Fund. There, there are literally dozens and dozens of UN entities out there that are designated as 
agencies, funds, and program programs. Their spend is not included in this slide. And, and as Leah mentioned, if we were to include the entire spend of the whole UN system, we would be looking at a figure closer to $15, $17 billion per year. For the Secretariat alone, to support those entities that I mentioned previously, we are in the $2.7 to $3.2 billion range. Um, you can see that there's a bit of a downward trend here from 2016 to 2020. There are various reasons for that. Uh, one reason is that we've looked at a few very high spend um, categories and had a concerted effort to reduce the spend in those areas. And I'll, and I'll talk a little bit of, a more about that in the next slide. And also in 20, if we could go back one slide, please. And also in 2015 and 2016, we had some of our bigger missions were starting up or were, were in full swing. The mission in South Sudan, mission in Mali, the mission, mission in uh, Central African Republic, um, the mission in the Congo. Uh, so when we see mission startups or missions who are really ramping up operations, this spend increases. Um, so this spend is very much tied to the missions operations. Okay, next slide, please. So what are we spending our money on? So in the number one spend in 2020 was ICT, which is information, communication, technology, almost 400 million. Uh, the second is air transport, which was previously the number one spend category. And this is one of the areas where we really had a very close look to see where we can uh, find some savings. Uh, the reason this number is so large is that air transport requirements are uh, present in every single peacekeeping mission. Each mission will have a fleet of aircraft, fixed wing aircraft, rotary wing aircraft, cargo aircraft. And this is because of the operating environment um, in which they're found. It is very difficult to move troops and to move cargo in, in some of the countries in which we operate. So uh, we have a fleet of aircraft to support that and we do not purchase aircraft. Everything comes from lease or charter. Next, we have food and catering. Again, all of these missions will have catering contracts. All of the offices away from headquarters will have catering contracts to support the uh, staff and support the troops. Um, this is in the headquarters as well as in the sectors. We have, uh, in addition to this, we have food contracts, uh, systems contracts for food, including uh, MREs, meals ready to eat, uh, which are used to support our troops deployed worldwide. Uh, each mission will also have a fuel contract. The fuel contracts will cover things like diesel fuel, petrol fuel, jet A1 fuel, and any sorts of other fuel requirements that the missions may have. Um, building and construction. I think building and construction is a good example of a type of requirement that would be done locally by the mission. I mentioned earlier that sometimes you will have requirements coming from HQ and sometimes you will have requirements coming from the missions themselves. So for example, if the mission in Mali wants to build a level one hospital in one of the sectors, uh, that requirement is not gonna be done by me based in New York. It is better served to be done locally by the procurement officials based in MINUSMA, which is the mission in Mali, uh, as they're able to know the local market better and handle the requirement um, more efficiently. Some other uh, categories we have here, real estate, um, we have transportation and freight forwarding. Uh, just a note on transportation freight forwarding. If we're buying goods from a Canadian supplier, the contract is generally established on an FCA basis using Inco Terms 2020. So in the contract, we will have a designated FCA point established. Okay, so that means that while we are operating in very difficult environments around the world, um, most of the good suppliers are only required to make the goods available at the FCA point at the agreed uh, time and, and, um, and price. So at that point, our designated freight network will pick up the cargo from the FCA point, let's say in Canada, and we will ship the cargo to the missions ourselves. You will be paid net 30 upon pickup of the cargo from the FCA point. When the cargo does finally reach the mission area, it will be subject to what we call R and I receipt and inspection. Okay, next we have security services, professional services, which are things like consultancies, uh, financial and insurance. This is financial related to the pension fund and insurance of um, both staff and our global cargo insurance policy. And pharmaceuticals and health is, is obviously something that's gone way up with uh, COVID the last few years. And vehicles, I am currently the team leader of the vehicles team in New York, and uh, we spent 56 million on vehicles in 2020. Uh, this number in 2021 is going up to about 71 million. Um, and I just wanna make a note here. If you don't see a particular category where you think that you're, um, you're involved in, uh, don't let that discourage you. Uh, some of these are, are very generic terms, but there are lots and lots of different subcategories found. Uh, for example, vehicles, Yes, we buy sedans and we buy four by fours, but we also 
uh, have under vehicles material handling equipment, which are things like forklifts. We have engineering equipment, which is earth moving equipment and backhoes and bulldozers. Uh, we have airfield ground handling equipment, which are tow motors and, and ground power units. We have uh, multiple tire contracts. We have spare part contracts. So um, under these uh, generic terms, there are lots and lots of subcategories, just to, to um, let you know that. Next slide, please. Okay, spend with Canadian suppliers with the Secretariat between 2017 and 2020 ranges from the 35 to, to $49 million range. Okay, so as a comparison to the spend we saw on the previous slide, obviously this is a, a small amount. Uh, however, I, I wanna use this as an opportunity to uh, invite Canadian suppliers to participate. What we need to see is really good quality suppliers, suppliers who are able to uh, support the, the mandates of the United Nations. And we know that Canadian suppliers offer that quality. Uh, so we wanna look at this as an opportunity to have Canadian suppliers getting on board, registering and bidding on our requirements so that we can increase these numbers. Next slide, please. So specific spend in 2020 with Canadian suppliers, um, the 36 million you see here, half of that came from air transport. And we talked a little bit about the, uh, the necessity to have air transport assets in the field earlier. Um, so 50% of the 2020 spend is entirely from air transport, uh, which means that the remaining 50% comes from some of the other categories that you see here. Again, we wanna use this as an opportunity to invite Canadian suppliers to register and see if we can't get these numbers increased in the, in the future. Next slide, please. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the UN procurement principles. Uh, and these are the procurement principles that are written in stone, if you will. They're part of the United Nations financial regulations and rules. Okay, and the first procurement principle we have here is the objectives and the needs of the UN. Okay, so any decision that we take will always be in the best interest of the organization. And why do we come out and, and say that so bluntly right in the financial rules? This is because we are operating in conflict zones, post-conflict zones, war zones. We're dealing with humanitarian issues, uh, human rights issues. So we reserve the right to take any decision that is ultimately going to be in the best interest of the UN. That being said, Fairness, integrity, and transparency is also one of the UN procurement principles. So each of these solicitations is issued to vendors who are all on equal footing. Okay, they are treated equally fair and, and the fairness doctrine is something that we take very, very seriously. Um, companies of any size and any, um, uh, any level of experience provided that you meet the requirements in the solicitation uh, can be invited to participate and ultimately win contracts. Uh, integrity is also something that we take very seriously. We are spending public funds. We spend member state contributions is where our funding comes from. So it's very important that any decision that we take is done with the utmost integrity. And in terms of transparency, we've built several uh, steps into the process that is geared towards transparency. And I'll, and I'll talk about that when we get to the next slide, uh, but we do have some um, provisions on transparency built right into the procurement process. Effective international competition is another procurement principle, and, and that is why I'm here today, is to recruit Canadian companies to get on board and start participating. We're mandated to have effective international competition in all of our solicitations, so we really need to have uh, as much competition as possible from around the world, particularly with our global systems contracts. And then we have best value for money. Um, best value for money is, is something that is applied at every step of the procurement process, including the sourcing step. And this is again, why we need to have as many companies participating as possible. Uh, it is in our interest to have competition for all of these requirements. Of course, there's a, a technical and a commercial evaluation process that uh, will do a best value for money weighted score, which I'll talk about on the next slide. Um, but in terms, uh, generally speaking, best value for money is something that we're uh, looking for for each of our requirements. Next slide, please. Okay, let's talk a little bit about a typical UN procurement workflow. And it starts with procurement planning. So typically what will happen is um, the procurement colleagues will have a discussion with the logistics division or the, the whatever, whoever the requisitioner for the requirement is. And we'll have a discussion about uh, what the requirement is, what are the existing contracts? Can they, can they not meet the requirement? Do we have contracts through missions or through other UN entities that can meet the requirement? And if we have a new requirement where we need to go to the market, then we'll start talking a little bit more about the procurement definition. We'll have a look at the statement of work and ensure that it's generic in nature. 
Um, we will start talking about what type of solicitation we will do, whether we will do an ITB, whether we will do an RFP, or if it's a low dollar requirement, we may do an RFQ. Uh, if it's even lower than that, it could be a, a, what we call a low value procurement. So we'll have a discussion about uh, what type of procurement document will be issued to the market. Uh, and next, we'll start to do some market research and advertisement. Anytime we do a formal solicitation, an ITB or an RFP, we are required to issue what's called an REOI, a request for express, expression of interest. Okay, and that is a one to two page document that will be sent to um, companies who are registered in UNGM, which we'll talk about in a little bit, uh, for this certain category of requirement that we're going to the market for. We will also proactively do market research. We'll look for uh, companies through other UN entities, through internet research, and um, through chambers of commerce, and we will proactively reach out to you and ask you to register in UNGM, and we will send you the REOI so that you complete the document and send it back to us. Um, selection of procurement strategy. So we have what's internally, uh, it's an internal document called the source selection plan. Uh, this source selection plan will be signed off by both the procurement division and the requisitioner. That document will detail the procurement strategy. It will have a agreed upon timeline for the procurement process. It will have the number of vendors to be invited. It will have uh, information about the technical and the, and the commercial evaluation criteria. And that way we have in writing the agreement between the procurement division and the requisition on how we're gonna proceed. From that point, we go to preparation and issuance of solicitation documents. So we will send out the solicitation document itself. It will have the contact information of the UN procurement officials. It will have information on how you submit your bid, how you ask questions, what the bid bond amount would be, what the performance amount, for performance bond amount would be. Um, it will have information, of course, on the technical and the commercial criteria, and that will go out to all those vendors who are approved to receive the solicitation. Next, we see bidders conferences. Um, bidders conferences are sometimes required in solicitations. So we will either have a mandatory bidders conference or we will have an optional bidders conference, and sometimes bidders conferences will not be required at all. Um, with COVID, we've seen a lot less bidders conferences, of course, but why do we have bidders conferences? One of the reasons is, again, we're operating in very diff difficult environments, and if you as a supplier are going to be sending your staff into that operating environment, we want you to be aware of what it's like to live and to work in um, very difficult regions uh, in order to be able to support the uh, the UN's requirements in those missions. Again, they are sometimes required, they, they are sometimes optional. Uh, receipt and opening of offers. So we have a dedicated team in the Enabling and Outreach Service, EOS, that is responsible for receipt and safeguarding of offers. Um, they will hold on to the offers. They will distribute the offers once they are informed to do so, for example, for an RFP. Uh, we will only look at the technically acceptable offers, and we will have our EOS colleagues uh, send us those offers as soon as they're received. Uh, the evaluation, technical and commercial, is something that is done um, simultaneously for an ITB. However, for an RFP, we will only commercially evaluate the technically acceptable offers. Okay, so the technical um, evaluation will be done by our colleagues in usually at H HQ in the logistics division. Um, and once they've completed their evaluation, they'll contact PD and we'll proceed with the commercial evaluation. Uh, from that point, we will do a combined score, a weighted score. Um, what's important to note here is that we typically weigh the technical higher than we do the commercial. Again, as I mentioned, we're looking for quality. Um, we're looking for companies who can meet the, the rigorous demands of the UN. Uh, so technical is typically weighted 60% and commercial 40%. I've seen as high as 70, 30 for some complex cases. Uh, so that this is to remind you that just because you have the lowest technically acceptable offer doesn't necessarily mean that you're gonna be awarded the contract. Okay, from that point on, we'll go through our internal review committee. Uh, in HQ, it's called the Headquarters Committee on Contracts, the HCC. Uh, the missions also have LCCs, Local Committees on Contracts. Um, and the HCC will basically review our work. They will um, look at everything from beginning to end to ensure that all the proper uh, processes and procedures were followed. Um, and they will ultimately make a recommendation on whether to proceed or not to proceed. They do not approve. Uh, they recommend, and they recommend to the approver, who is the Assistant Secretary General in the Office of Supply Chain Management, 
Now that's Mr. Christian Saunders. And Mr. Saunders will ultimately make the decision on whether we can move forward with a contract. Next, we have contract award and letter of uh, regret. Um, if you are successful, we will contact you and we'll start to have discussions on what the contract will look like. Uh, oftentimes, the HCC will recommend uh, negotiations prior to contract award, and that's something that we do quite frequently. Um, but we will contact you and we will have a discussion about what the contract will look like and, um, and, and what the support element will look like in terms of supporting the missions once we, we move forward. If you're unsuccessful, you'll receive a, a letter of regret. And the letter of regret is a very important document because it includes information on how to request a debrief. And I highly encourage all participating companies to request a debrief. Uh, the debriefing program is, um, is, is an excellent way to get additional information about the strengths and weaknesses of your proposal. So if you do request a debrief, which I think needs to be requested within a certain amount of time after you receive the letter, a week or two weeks, I'm not sure. Um, the, the procurement officials and the technical officials will sit down with you, we will have a meeting and we will discuss the strengths and weaknesses of your proposal, okay? We won't discuss the proposals of any other companies. We will discuss your proposal in detail and we can give you an idea on both the technical and the commercial side, uh, how strong or weak your proposal was. And this allows you to come back at a later date for another requirement and really give us a, a stronger proposal. If you're still not satisfied at the debriefing stage, you can request um, that we take the case to what is called the Award Review Board, the ARB. Um, this is sort of a rare occurrence. Typically vendors are satisfied once they've received a formal debrief, but just for your information, we do have the ARB process um, as, part of, uh, as part of our transparency. Next slide, please. Okay, so what are the procurement challenges that we face? Again, we've sort of touched on this a bit already, but um, we are operating in very, very difficult environments um, where there are little to no uh, infrastructure and limited resources. Uh, oftentimes there are uh, diseases or in response to disease, as you can see on the bottom right, we had an entire mission established uh, to combat the Ebola crisis. Um, natural disasters is also something that we respond to and also face from time to time in the mission area. I'm sure everyone remembers the earthquake in Haiti uh, some time back, which devastated our, our mission in Haiti. Um, but these are very, very difficult zones in which to operate. So we'd like to bring this to the attention of our vendors and our potential vendors so that everyone knows uh, what they're getting into when they do business with the UN. But again, um, for good suppliers, we are generally looking for cargo up to the FCA point and for uh, suppliers of various services who may uh, be in the mission area, we really want you to know the operating environment that you're involved in. So we, that's why we have these, these bidders conferences. Uh, we can go to the next slide, please. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs. So the Sustainable Development Goals were established in 2015. Uh, there are 17 different Sustainable Development Goals that cover things like um, access to clean water and climate change. Um, some of the areas where procurement has a specific focus are, are listed here. Um, Women-owned businesses is a big one. So uh, we are always encouraging women-owned businesses to participate more uh, in the United Nations system. Uh, we also are looking for vendors from developing countries and economies in transition, uh, while also targeting some specific industry categories. One particular SDG we've highlighted here is the decent work and economic growth, as you can see. Uh, and procurement is directly involved as part of the task team that's working with what we call the high level committee on management procurement network, which is procurement representatives from all the UN entities around the world. And procurement is in the lead for um, the United Nations disability inclusion strategy as part of this specific SDG. So uh, familiarize yourself with the SDGs because they drive a lot of the requirements that we have. Next slide, please. Okay, now we've come to UNGM, which is one of the most important slides we'll see today. Um, UNGM, or the United Nations Global Marketplace, is the um, global hub for registration with the United Nations. Uh, you cannot do business with the United Nations unless you register in UNGM. So, so keep that in mind. Uh, registration is mandatory. Um, but the great thing about UNGM is that it offers uh, a number of different things. First, there's a ton of really good information on UNGM about the different work that we do worldwide and statistics and things of that nature. It also 
allows you to search for specific requirements, not only from the Secretariat, but from those agencies, funds, and programs that I mentioned. There are keyword searches. There are search functionalities that allow you to see uh, tenders that have been launched by those entities. Uh, you can also sign up uh, for the tender alert service, which would um, send you a notification when a tender in your certain um, commodity or category uh, is issued. So it's a proactive way to uh, have, uh, have us reach out to vendors. And also the registration portal allows you to register for not only the secretariat, um, but you can with a few clicks register for all those other agencies, funds and programs that I mentioned. Can, they can all be registered directly through UNGM. So uh, keep that in mind uh, when you do your registration that you, you don't, not only have to select UNS, UN secretariat, but um, you can start registering uh, with a few clicks for all those different entities. Go to the next slide, please. Okay, so if we can go over one more. Okay, so there's, there's three levels of registration with the United Nations Global Marketplace. First, we have the basic level, which is uh, we need a few pieces of information for you, from you, and then you could be registered as a basic level vendor and you do business up to $150,000. Can you go over? Okay, and then we have level one registration, which is up to 500,000 where we will need a uh, certificate of incorporation and a few other bits of information from you. Can go over one more. And then we have level two, which is above 500,000. When we start talking about contracts above $500,000, um, we wanna see additional information from companies, uh, particularly certified financial statements. And the reason we wanna see this information is because we are establishing long-term partnerships with, these, uh, with companies and we have to ensure that those companies are viable over the long-term so that we have uh, an adequate source of supply to the, uh, to the missions and the end users in the field. Um, one thing to keep in mind about the UNGM registration levels, if you see a requirement that is uh, a multi-million dollar requirement and you would like to participate in that solicitation and you're only at the basic level, you do not need to be at the level two level to receive and respond to the solicitation. Okay, so if you see something and you don't have the financial statements ready or you're not ready to send in all of the information that we require for, for level one or level two, you can still request the solicitation documents. Um, these are long term solicitations generally, some of them take six months to a year to complete, and that will give you time to complete your registration. You must, however, be registered by the time we are prepared to take the case through our internal review body. So it usually be by the time the bid closes, we would want the registration process to be completed. But keep in mind that it doesn't have to be completed at the time the documents are issued. Next slide, please. Okay, so we are transitioning to an e-tendering platform. Uh, this is an SAP Ariba e-tendering platform. Uh, this is very new for all of us at the procurement division in New York. I actually have not issued a solicitation through Ariba yet, although I do have several in the pipeline, which will be issued in the next couple of weeks. Um, the important thing to remember about Ariba is that, is that it only uses the supplier information that you have uploaded to UNGM. Okay, so it is linked to the UNGM system. So anyone in your company who you want to receive the solicitation, you should have their contact information in UNGM. Uh, there are a few QR codes here you can see to become familiar with the Ariba network. Uh, we encourage you to um, review those videos. And there's also a letter from the director of the procurement division here, as well as some UNGM help center uh, information here that can allow you to um, learn about how to use Ariba. Next slide, please. Some other important information is here. Uh, we talked a little bit already about what is available on UNGM and how um, how great of a platform UNGM, UNGM is for finding information for vendors. Uh, another important document, which is also in UNGM is in the middle here, the annual statistical report. The ASR will provide um, in-depth detail on all the different commodities and, and services that are required, not only by the secretariat, but by all those agencies, funds and programs that I mentioned earlier. So if you're not sure, if an agency fund and program is buying the type of uh, commodity or service that you offer, uh, have a look at the ASR and you might see some of the subcategories that are being, um, being procured by those entities and it might give you an idea of which of those entities to target. And finally, we have the procurement practitioners handbook. Uh, this is something that we use as a guide in procurement. 
uh, it is open to the public to review and to um, have a look at so you understand uh, some of the different uh, processes and procedures that uh, UN procurement uh, undertakes when processing a solicitation and, and we make that available also on UNGM. Next slide, please. Okay, um, key resources for vendors here. Uh, first, we have the general conditions of contract. Uh, the general conditions of contract are usually appended to a formal solicitation in ITB or an RFP so that the vendors have an opportunity to, re to review them. And typically we will ask you in your response to the solicitation to sign off that you agree to the general conditions of contract. While they're not written in stone, they are promulgated by the United Nations Office of Legal Affairs. And uh, we generally ask uh, vendors not to try to negotiate the UNGCCs because this is something uh, that is, um, you know, as I mentioned, promulgated by OLA, Office of Legal Affairs, and they're typically something that we don't negotiate. Uh, we do have the UN Supplier Code of Conduct as well listed here, and that's something when you're registering UNGM, you'll be asked to review and to sign um, uh, to affirm as well. And, and finally, we have the UN Procurement Division website. There's lots of good information on the Procurement Division's website, including the United Nations Procurement Manual, which is uh, our policy document, which you can review as well. Uh, and there's also information on supplier awards. Um, we have supplier awards posted to our website as well as to UNGM. Next slide, please. Okay, we also have an app, the United Nations Procurement Mobile app. Um, this app is a very good tool to keeping in touch with the United Nations Procurement Division. It lists business opportunities, upcoming seminars, different public tender openings, uh, what days are you in holidays, it also has purchase orders and contract information listed. Um, there's a search functionality. It's available for both Apple and Android. Uh, there's also a QR code here. So we encourage you to please also download the app because it's a great way to keep in touch with what we're doing in UN procurement. Next slide. Okay, so we've come to the end of the presentation and um, we're, we're happy to take any questions or clarify anything that you, that, uh, that you would like us to clarify. Uh, just a few very common questions we like to cover uh, proactively. Um, the first one here, as a small vendor, is registering with UNGM worthwhile for me? As the UN is such a large organization, would I ever have an opportunity to do business with the United Nations Secretariat? And the answer to this question is a resounding yes. We do business with companies of, of all sizes. Uh, we have some companies who do the majority of their business with the UN. And we have some companies who are major international manufacturers and the business of the UN is a, is a drop in the bucket to them. However, um, they are interested in doing business with the UN for uh, the reasons of supporting international peace and security. Um, but in terms of business opportunities, yes, you have the opportunity to do business with the UN regardless of the size of your company, provided that you can complete the UN registration on UNGM and that you can meet the technical and the um, uh, commercial requirements of the bid that we mentioned earlier. And next we have, we have a new product that we believe the United Nations should know about. Who should we talk to and how do we contact them? So we've listed some contact information here. The UNPD website has a contact us section. Uh, UNGM is also a good focal point for contacting the UN in terms of uh, outreach. We are always receiving information on new products and services. It typically will come through the procurement colleagues who will then liaise with the logistics or the um, technical colleagues, and we can send them their inf your information and, and have a discussion about, um, about the capabilities of your company. Um, I am always here as well. My contact information is on the next slide, and if you ever sent an email and you didn't hear back, feel free to reach out to me as well, and, and I'm happy to try to liaise internally with some of my colleagues and, and ensure that you get a response. So we can go to the next slide. Okay, so thanks very much for your time. Uh, really appreciate it. I, uh, I hope I was able to give you a good overview of what it means to do business with the UN. Um, your feedback is very important, so please do take a moment to participate in the survey here. Uh, we also have a, a link to the UN's main, the UN main webpage here, www.un.org, which is a good resource to familiarize yourself with the different uh, work of the UN. And my email address is here as well. Uh, so like I said, feel free to reach out to me with any questions or comments that you may have if there's something that's, that's not covered today or something that you, you think of later, you could reach out to the organizers or reach out to me. Thanks very much. Back to you, Camille. So uh, I want to say a big thank you to Dia and David for your presentation. Uh, their presentations and email address will be shared in a follow-up email I'll send up later today. 
Uh, so now we are at the um, question period. So does anyone has anything to ask? If so, uh, feel free to write them in the Q&A box. So we already have uh, some questions. Uh, so first one would be, uh, where do you see gaps in expertise or products that could be filled by Canadian firms? Thanks, Camille. Um, there are always opportunities for uh, companies to participate, whether there are gaps present or not. We're, like I said, we're always looking to increase participation. But from my own um, my own experience, we, we oftentimes have the best intentions to go out to the market and get uh, participating vendors. And then uh, we end up with, from time to time, uh, not as much competition and participation as we would like. I've seen some in my own category in vehicles where we had uh, solicitations that went out for construction equipment and light trucks, for example, where we didn't get the number of responses that we had hoped for. Um, but I think the most important thing is for you to be proactive, to reach out to the procurement officials in your area and start asking questions. Do you procure this good, this service? Um, you know, are you interested in my product? And I think that's the best way to uh, start that conversation. And also we, we are, while we do have experts on both the procurement and the technical side, we are always looking for innovation and for new products and services. Uh, so please do reach out to us with anything that you have that you think would be of interest to the UN. All right, thank, thank you very much for your answer. So we've got another one. What does professional service sector include? So professional services is um, primarily consultancies. We have a very, very large number of uh, consultancy contracts to support all the different entities operating in the secretariat. So we talked a lot about peacekeeping and we talked a lot about um, the mission support, but the headquarters support, the support of those uh, people living, uh, sorry, those the support of those people operating in the headquarters building often requires consultancies. And that could be for something like uh, uh, DESA, which is the Economic and Social Council or other uh, entities operating there. So it's, it's primarily consultancies, but it does cover some other professional requirements that actually make the building in New York run in some of the buildings in Geneva and in Vienna, for example. Thank you very much. Uh, we've got another uh, one from, um, we are an architectural and an engineering firm that has international experience. So do you think there's an opportunity for a firm like us to bid on UN projects or you usually use local firms? It depends. It depends on the scope of the requirement. Um, if it is in, there are um, projects that sometimes are done through international tenders. I mean, we've had uh, work done on the Secretariat building in New York and on the, uh, the building in Geneva, and those were subject to international tenders. Um, so again, it depends on the size and scope. But I would say yes, there are opportunities for these types of firms. Um, and, and again, it's important to keep an eye on the EOIs that are going out from UN uh, procurement website as well as UNGM and to have a, a, a meeting or a discussion with our engineering colleagues in New York. All right, thank you. Uh, we've got one technical question. So if it's possible to have the uh, replay of this, so uh, we'll send a link uh, in the follow-up email and uh, it will be also uh, possible to view the whole webinar in our YouTube um, channel page. So I'll send you the details afterwards. Uh, I've got another question. Do you provide assistance in the express of interest for new businesses? Uh, do we provide assistance? If you receive an EOI and you are a new business, the EOI will, will ask you what your UNGM number is. And if you do not have a UNGM number, that's the first thing you need to do is, is register on UNGM, at least at the basic level. And that's a very simple process. When you go into UNGM, there's a step-by-step -step process that you can follow. Um, and once you have that UNGM number, you can then revert back to the EOI, put the UNGM number in. And then the EOI is, is usually asking for some just basic information. It will have a description of what the requirement is. And if it's something that you feel that you can bid on and participate in, uh, you basically just fill out your company information and then send it back to the procurement official listed in the EOI. And then from that point, we will, um, we will invite you to participate in the solicitation. All right, thank you. Uh, we've got more questions here. So can you speak to the need for data analytics, which can support many of the areas of procurement? Sure. I mean, as you saw from the presentation, we the, the number one spend we have is on information communication technology and uh, data analysis is, is one of those areas. 
Uh, we have a dedicated team in the procurement division handling these types of requirements. Uh, it would be good to uh, reach out to them and, and describe your capabilities to them and see if there's a uh, type of requirement that they have that uh, your company is able to uh, able to meet. So let's uh, let's follow up with the contact us information or um, you know contact me and I can get you in touch with that team. All right, thank you. So we've got another one. Uh, so we've bid on many different uh, RFPs from various UN organizations. However, uh, we rarely receive uh, follow-up communications as to the award status. So for example, was the contract awarded? If so, to whom? So how did our bid rank, et cetera? So basically what can we do to get this type of information so we can better understand how to improve future bids? Yeah, this is a good question. Uh, for formal solicitation, solicitations, like I mentioned in the presentation, you should be contacted at the end of the procurement process and informed formally whether you are successful or unsuccessful. And if you are unsuccessful, we are required to offer you a debrief. Okay, so if it is an ITB or an RFP and it's from the secretary in New York and you do not have a regret letter, I would encourage you to go back and contact the procurement officials that are in the solicitation document and ask questions. What is the status? Why was I not contacted? Um, certainly do that. The, um, the debrief process, as I mentioned, is something that is, is very, very valuable. So we want to give uh, all of our bidding, uh, all of our bidders an opportunity to, to have a debrief. Um, so I don't know if these requirements had come through the secretariat, but if they have, please do follow up. In terms of who was awarded the contract, that information is typically posted after the contract award is completed. It should be posted in one of two places, on the United Nations Procurement Division website or in UNGM. If you don't see the contract award posted there, again, please contact the, contact the procurement officials in the bid. All right, thank you. So we've got another question. Which agencies should be targeted for the food sector? So for the food sector, it's obviously a very, very general term, food. We, we buy food in the procurement division. We have a food team. And again, this goes back to catering. It goes back to the meal ready to eat systems contract that we have. Um, I don't know what type of food that, that this, um, this company is involved in, but um, the areas in which you would want to look are the food team specifically within the secretariat. Okay. And you also want to look at the World Food Program and the food and agriculture organization. Those are the big entities who are buying uh, food or uh, food type products in support of field operations. Um, so you can reach out to them. Thank you. We've got another question. Do you do environmental remediation? Yeah, so um, each mission has environmental requirements uh, individually, and I think that any sort of environmental remediation would come requirements would come from the missions directly. Um, a, another good resource may be the annual statistical report to see what other entities are handling requirements that are of uh, of that nature. So have a look, um, but also keep keep an eye on the UNGM search functionality, uh, the keyword search for these types of requirements because there may be entities who are already launching these these solicitations, um, you know, uh, at present. All right, so we've got one last question here. So as a hotelier in Canada, I would like to have an idea regarding the UN business travel. Is it globally on standby right now? Do you think that things will get back to normal soon for traveling? Yeah, so business travel is essentially on hold, um, obviously due to the pandemic. Uh, I do see this opening up a bit more Recently, I, I know a few colleagues who have been traveling, and of course, some senior officials have been traveling throughout. Uh, and when will we get back to a, a period of time where we have the amount of travel that we've had in the past? That's very, very difficult to say. Um, but as we get through this pandemic and, and we move towards this new normal, I, I do anticipate that we will see uh, travel requirements increasing. Obviously, the UN has a huge um, number of staff and a huge travel budget. Um, and, and I do see that that um, that happening in, in the future as we get through the pandemic. Thanks. All right. So thank you very much. We're now at the end of the question period. So thank you, Leah and David, for your time today. Um, everyone, you'll be automatically directed to a satisfaction survey as you leave the platform, which I invite you to please complete. 
and we'll also make the video recording available on our website and on uh, our YouTube channels in the next days. So on behalf of the Chamber of Commerce of Metropolitan Montreal, I would like to thank you for joining us today. And it was a pleasure for me to be your host. And I wish you all a good day and hope to see you at our next events.